values and stereotypes that kind of impact the decisions that we make, how we understand content, how we understand the world around us, and it's in an unconscious way, right? And one thing I always say at this time when I talk about implicit bias is that you're responsible for your second thought and your first action. And that is because the unconscious bias lives in that first thought. So you really can't be responsible for that unless you're going to pay attention to that and re recognize it, call it out, reframe your thinking, right? and then you're responsible for that second thought, how you've changed and worked with your unconscious bias and your first action. Right? So we form this outside of our own conscious awareness by the way the brain operates, right? The brain is designed with this fight or flight mechanism. And we associate things in our brain based on our encounters with attitudes, with people, with our outside world, right? Our beliefs, our identity groups. And our brain tends to categorize all of these things. It wants to put them in an orderly way with like things all together. And so we have to be aware of how this bias, implicit bias acts. We have to be conscious of it and we need to redirect it in a positive way. Anything to add, Megan? Nope, I think that's great. And what I want to talk about is, and I just also, I'll just point real, real, real quick here, that you have the implicit associ uh, association test, and that's from Harvard. And there's um, a great series of tests there about all different types of bias that we are all prone to. And so you may think, oh, I don't have any bias, but we all have biases. That's the thing. We all have biases. And so it's important is to recognize our biases, right? And so this implicit bias test uh, that Harvard has created allows you to really see where your bias is and then to work against it, right? To help recognize it when it comes up and then take actions, right? against your bias as opposed to with your bias. Okay. Thanks, Maureen. Um, so the next thing that we're going to talk about is how our bias can affect our, our students, right, our teaching. And so here are a couple of different examples, right? Um, when, you know, as faculty, if we have bias and we're not recognizing it and we're not acting against it, right, this can lead to these scenarios. Instructors who believe that students speak other languages have poor grammar and or don't write well, right? Instructors may assume that students don't need help when they do, right? Instructors might incorrectly associate students with figures in the curriculum who resemble them demographically, right? Instructors may assume students know how to seek help when the research shows that students who are facing academic struggles are less likely to reach out for help, right? Instructors might believe that students with physical disabilities also have mental disabilities and treat them differently. And instructors might believe students who identify with certain groups should be experts on the issues pertaining to that specific group and really represent that entire group for the whole class. Okay. So these, these are impacts that are implicit. These are just some small number of impacts of the way that implicit bias can affect our teaching. Right. And so we just kind of wanted to start with that. Like, What is implicit bias? What are some ways that it can affect our students and our teaching? And then what we're going to kind of move on to next is really looking at our content and how we can focus on our content first and then our facilitation in order to identify bias in our content and then right work against that. Okay. So we had plans on having breakout groups, but Maureen, do we have enough folks for breakout groups or do, should we be working together? What do you think? So we have about 12, 12 people here with us today. So we could do three breakout rooms if we want to do okay. groups of four. Okay, so if we do those three breakout groups, then let's kind of, let's look at the next um, two slides. So we're going to, uh, the next slide just tells us we're going to look at our content, which we know, and then the slide after that is going to say that we, this is what we're going to do in our groups. 
So each group is going to have a slide and we were feeling, you know, maybe autumnal or, you know, really feeling the, the vegetation. So your group is going to be named after, you know, a tree or a bush or a flower. So, you know, <laughs> that. And so you might be, you know, group yellow tree, right? Because we, we want all those uh, leaves to turn yellow. And then um, you're going to look at the resources on our slide, and then you're going to answer these two questions that we started with. Either where or how are you addressing bias in your course content? And where do you want to stretch yourselves and create an action plan to design and develop inclusive content? And then you're going to decide who or what you want to share with the bigger group. Okay, so um, we will split into our groups and uh, we will have, we're going to have three groups, Maureen. Okay. Three groups. Three groups. And so our first group is going to be our red cactus group. And our red cactus group is going to look at uh, uh, images and representation, right? So Wayne, that's some of what you were already kind of bringing up, right? Our second group is going to be our yellow tree group. Um, and our yellow tree group is going to look at um, hidden figures in the field, and then our third group is going to be our pink flower group, and they're going to look at disciplinary bias. Okay, so we have these three groups, and uh, you'll see that you have your prompt, and then you have resources um, around that prompt, and then you have uh, at the very end, okay, this is, you know, your directions for, for what you should share with each other. Maureen, do you want to give some more directions about how they should be sharing out? Yeah, sure. Do you want me to put them in the rooms first? Well, do you want to get directions before we go in the rooms? Okay. okay. So I have three rooms and I want to give you the slides as well. So let me grab that link. I Which can do the slides while you okay. talk about the directions. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll put the slides in the chat for everyone to be able to have access to. So based on your icon, right? And we were very <laughs> thinking about outsides in fall while we were doing these slides this week. Um, you will see a ver uh, your prompts. So when we are on your in this area, we want you to focus on your couple of slides that have your icon. So if you are in the red cactus group, you're going to look at the red cactus slides, right? Here's some directions Megan already went over. The This next slide is like your example. This is your content. This is what a, an example that we have um, found for you. You can go ahead and take a look at the Peralta online rubric, okay? And you can talk about this example and come up with one of your own, or you can talk about how this would work in your area, right? And then that's what you're gonna report out. Uh, this is another example, right? We want you to go ahead and look at this content. We have a little video for you here and look at the equity training that Peralta has. And when you get to this slide, this is kind of what you're going to be thinking about as a group. You're going to be addressing those questions that we prompted you at the beginning, but I wanted to give you a framework here. What are you doing with this strategy, this idea already, right? How would you do it? How are you doing it? And what makes it inclusive? And we're going to report that out on this Padlet. And I've created little prompts here for where you can drag your work. So when you make a make a, a padlet tile, I'm just going to put the example. Okay, I'm going to publish that. Then I can drag this right over here because I'm in the red cactus group, and this is going to be my example that shows my what I'm doing, how I'm doing, and why it's inclusive, right? Based on what discussions you have with the materials being provided you, and from your own knowledge. And one of the big benefits is we have so many experts in our audience today. So please share with each other and you can decide to share out something from our resources or you can decide to share out something from, that you are learning from each other. Okay, so we will um, go ahead and put you in groups and Maureen and I will pop around and make sure that you have what you need to be successful. I have a quick question because yes. it looks like we'll, in each group, we may have a different set of resources like the curated list of sites and gender spend spectrum collection if we're in red cactus will we all be able to get all these resources at the end yeah absolutely so even okay. chat i've already supplied you with the link to the slides with all the resources but we will send those around afterwards too 
Thank you very much. Everything. <laughs> okay. Are we ready? Okay. So do you, you're going to open up the groups and do you, you want everyone just to pop in where we go, right? Yep. Okay. Our group's coming back. Thank you. Okay. So can we get someone from our, let's start with our red cactus group. So can we get someone from our red cactus group to share a takeaway that you all had? Sure. Um, so we were talking about images and representation um, and we had two instructional designers and uh, one instructor in the group. And um, we just talked about how we try to sort of consciously make sure that we're including representations of, you know, a diverse group of people. Um, we talked a little bit about how sometimes it's challenging um, to find those images and kind of search terms and things that we use. Um, but, you know, that makes it inclusive because students see themselves reflected in the course materials. Uh, but we really want to stretch ourselves to kind of include, you know, sort of um, expand the diversity that we're um, showing in our in our course materials. So not just thinking about race or gender, but really including that of like gender expression, um, disability, size, age, all those types of things. Um, so we really uh, enjoy looking at the um, resources that were shared in the slides, really good sites um, that none of us really knew about. Um, and I, I bookmarked them, so I'm really excited to have that resource to use um, going forward. Great, and I'm just gonna real quickly share, show everybody else what that looks like. I have it open here. So um, this is a site called uh, the, the Gender Spectrum Collection, and this is one of the links that are in all the slides that you guys received. Um, and they have a, a variety of imagery and images of um, various different types of genders and in different types of settings and very inclusive and, and being looking really real, right? You could identify with these people. Um, and then the other site is, oops, sorry. Um, it's our red cactus group. Yeah, red cactus group. It's just a list of that's already been curated. So there's a list of a whole bunch of different stock photos, and it really has it li listed out as you are looking for natural women. They have a natural women. If you were looking for a disabilities collection, maybe you'll find it here. Uh, gender spectrum is what we just looked at, but there's you know a variety, queer and tech, you know, all different types of um, photos that. Uh, most of them are free. There's a few paid sites in here, but most of them are free resources. Enjoy. Okay, great. Okay, group Yellow Tree, what was the takeaway that you all had? Well, I guess I'll just talk. So um, we were, at, I'm sorry, we were uh, looking at course design, course content examples, and our area was to look at hidden figures. And so I think just speaking for myself as an edu you know, teacher of education folks, um, a lot of times we talk about educational theorists and all we talk about are old white men and we don't really pull the perspectives that there's other people, there's other perspectives, what, regardless of what that looks like. But so we talked about trying to not just include different perspectives, but also different types of media or mediums, I guess we should probably say. And I think Deborah had a really good point that while we always try to like get an expert to come in and do um, a lecture or talk with the students it's maybe we need to think about someone who's not specifically considered an expert but maybe someone who's in the community who's worked with this whatever population it is for 20 30 years to kind of validate that because they are they are an expert they're just not the the whatever the privileged expert that we've you know hey you're the expert in the field so um those are just some of the things we talked about doing okay i love that and our group pink flower Anybody want to share? I guess I'll share. Hi. Hi, Lori. <laughs> I'll just I'll just hop to it. Um, I think that it, for for our group, we talked about the, the major crux is that in certain fields, especially um, like literature or business, how 
there are uh, clear holds. For example, in certain uh, certain centuries of literature, there just maybe were not like women authors that were present or representation from various cultural or just even philosophical perspectives. Similarly, uh, the resource of experts in the field who may be called upon us uh, like guest speakers or just presenting the information may be liter uh, limited just for the fact of who, you know, sim uh, for example, um, uh, Charles mentioned if they, you know, they have a pool of, of guest speakers, it's based on the networks that are currently present or Wayne mentioned how, um, I think it was as high as 20% of PhD holders come from families of PhD holders. So, um, so when we're thinking about those limitations, and then I, I just as a last minute note considered from my field of health, that when we're looking for evidence-based medicine, I, I'm in like alternative health, um, it's not that certain practices aren't valid, but it all depends on where the investment of money may have been or, or where those resources were. And so there can be a sort of an undervaluation or a devaluation mm -hmm. of certain practices or fields until the, the mainstream or, or the majority group says, oh yes, vitamin C does work for this. So now everyone jump on the bandwagon. So, um, so sorry. So the basic crux is one, acknowledging these situations and then providing opportunities to, for example, have students choose a text that they'd like to read or, um, looking for other um, other guest speakers that are more representative of the diverse population of the students. So, so we felt like that was a major thing. One, acknowledging and being aware of it and then giving opportunity to try to continue to expand. I love that, thank you, that's wonderful. Okay, so we're gonna move on to our second segment, um, which is about facilitation and because we have about 20 minutes left. So I'm gonna do a real quick, um, you know, uh, hop into what we want to talk about and then let you guys back into your groups and then we'll do exactly what we just did. So I know that I am in a group that understands why belonging is so important, that um, having those social connections uh, makes students more likely to lean in, to apply themselves, that knowing that an instructor believes in themselves is correlated with students, you know, um, success in a course and their retention, um, that when we as faculty, you know, practice that selective vulnerability, portraying ourselves as a real person, talking about our, you know, personal struggles, uh, recording a video while we cook dinner or something like that, um, that allows us to really connect and build trust with our students. But if we are not addressing tensions and bias in our class, that is going to break that trust that we just built, right? So it's really important that we're doing both things, that we are creating belonging, and that also we're addressing tensions and bias. And that when we, right, um, you know, have a moment where we exhibit bias, that we model what we want our students to do, right, where we address it, some of the things that we talked about before, we acknowledge it, we address it, we apologize. Well, what do we want our students to do? That's exactly what we need to do if we exhibit bias in the classroom, right? We want to exhibit that growth mindset. And we know that all of these behaviors all together are going to increase students' persistence and engagement in the classroom, right? Um, online, you know, we call it scheduled remote, flexible online, scheduled remote, whatever your institution is calling all of our wonderful online modalities now. Okay, so in order to talk about this, we are going to get you back into your groups. And we have um, a couple of different options for you this time. Our Red Cactus group is going to look at something called warm and wise feedback. Our um, yellow tree group is going to look at something called the Raven approach, which is I'll tell you, I love the Peralta online equity rubric and the Raven approach is one of my um, other favorites. It's by Dr. Frank Harris and Dr. Luke Wood. And I just can't say enough about them. Um, they're some of my favorite folks out there. And then we have the pink flower is going to look at um, back at that Peralta online equity rubric again and talk about what are some of these aligned examples, what are these best practices and aligned examples. But remember that you all can just start with talking to each other about what you're already doing, you know, what, what does this mean to you? So our examples are there, our resources are there, but you can just talk to each other and share with each other. 
We're going to give you, I'm going to call it eight minutes <laughs> because we have to have a little time to share up and wrap up when we get back. Okay. So Maureen, can you put our folks back into our groups again? Okay. Well, <laughs> Sorry, Julie, it looks like we pulled you mid comment or mid. No, I, I was laughing. It's okay. okay. <laughs> the one thing I will just say, Julie, to finish up is I'm not always clear in an asynchronous format how to do that mm -hmm. because I think calling out students after the fact yeah. when there's a tension between two students, I don't necessarily think is helpful to those two students nor to the class as a whole. So I think it's tricky. No, I think you're absolutely right. I don't think there's one. And Liz, I do. It all comes back. To yeah, you. one of the things that one of the things that we have done asynchronously, though, and I have to say, I do. I I don't. It doesn't happen often, but it's important, especially if it happens in text, in the writing, in a discussion, that we go ahead and address it in that same context, and you and we will take the post down but we will explain why we took the post down if if there was some issue about it. If it was that much of an, of, of an egregious type of post, we will take it down. And, and, but we will explain why. Yeah, we don't, have, we don't tend to have highly egregious, but there might be something that might be an example of implicit bias that not even everybody is recognizing, but one student is recognizing and feeling very sensitive to. And then, yeah, it's just. It's tricky. It's tricky, you know, and, and what are you going to call out each of those students who are tussling a little bit? Yeah, it's I'm not, I'm not fully clear, but I think that's a good idea. If there's something egregious, I I agree. That's a good idea, and we've never talked about it in our department. I don't think we've really run across something very, you know, highly egregious. But that is a good idea. So we're starting with the yellow trees because they have had such a great conversation, and um, I will say that I I have really liked the Raven approach. Did you guys look at the Raven approach when you were talking at all? Well, I think we we looked at the the slides. We had some mm -hmm. questions about the first step in terms of the wording, but mm -hmm. that's another conversation. But no, the the video that's on there is an hour long, so we didn't really have time. For oh, that. yeah. Well, I summarized it right here. Like, yeah, no, that's what I was talking about. Yeah, this is the cheat the cheat sheet for the long video. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we might just choose a different word for number one, which is recognize what's going on. Rather than um, redirect. Then redirect. Yeah. 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 Um, but the, nice the, the intervene, correct, right? Do something to kind of get in there as the faculty member yourself, mm -hmm. right? Ask that probing question, do the values clarification, right? And this helps if you have done that um, some kind of contract in that beginning of the class where you say, what are the values of my class, right? Mm -hmm. But do you, you know, a diversity statement or, you know, some kind of um, value statement with your students of what kind of class that you want to try to have with them. Um, and then I, when I hear this, I think, right, um, next time you may want to so, and you can think about which of these you want to do publicly and which one of these you want to do with the student themselves. Thank you. Good, other, other thoughts from our yellow tree group? Okay. Okay, what about our red flower group? Or red cactus. Oh, sorry, I'm getting my colors confused with my trees. And flora and fauna, yes. Pink flower or red cactus? Red cactus. Um, I can share. So uh, we talked about um, the warm and wise feedback. Um, honestly, I, we, I didn't personally get a chance to look at any of the resources that you all had shared because there were so many great ideas uh, from our group. Um, oh. But, excuse me, um, <clears throat> one thing that was shared that I thought was um, very powerful, just like a simple mindset shift. Um, it's just kind of reframing how certain things are phrased. 
Um, so uh, Brianna and our group was talking about how instead of calling something a late policy, um, calling it an opportunity policy, um, and just kind of subtle shifts like that, where it sort of emphasizes the more positive aspects of something versus the punitive. Um, I love that. Lots that's of other, you know, great ideas, but that's just kind of a quick one to share. That's great. Thank you. Okay, and our pink flower. It's a standoff again in our pink flower group. Who's going to share? Charles, is it you this time? Lori did it last time. Yeah, we didn't see who's going to bring. <laughs> um, so, I mean, we we um, the, we we had the we should... so we're talking about uh cost facilitation so you know one one of the um one of the items we talked about is you know how, getting the class to let's say in maybe it's a class setting getting the the class to to get started and one of them was just to get the students to share a little bit about about themselves mm -hmm. um we found you know that to be a to be a you know to be an effective uh, effective way of of doing it um and then we talked about um i was talking for myself i was talking about you know uh we have courses where um we have you know case studies um and you know sometimes our students may be you know let's say we have a lot of asian students in in one course and we are talking about as we're talking about amazon and you know sometimes they may not um relate to that so maybe meeting the students where they are and trying to see um what is it what exactly um you know would fit in um in that conversation with them um also seeking feedback from the students i think it's wayne who who had that that idea and just saying um you know just maybe pausing and asking them you know you know help mm -hmm. you know you can help you know it's part of that continuous improvement of of the course and seeking their feedback um and seeing how you can you can improve so love that that's great yeah. thank you so much for sharing um, so we have a couple last little takeaway slides. So these are some things to think about as you go away. So we usually think about um, this kind of training as we, we want to be reflective on ourselves. We want to be reflective of our content. And we want to be reflective of our facilitation. And we didn't really get to talk about ourselves. So we're ending with being reflective on ourselves. And we're going to suggest a couple little strategies if you, you know, are interested in them um, for ways that we can, you know, be reflective of our own selves and implicit bias. And one thing that there's research out there about is mindfulness. And just doing normal mindfulness practices helps reduce correspondence bias. And so that's something to kind of keep in mind, right? If you have a mindfulness practice, if you're just doing your meditation, right? If you're just taking that time to kind of calm yourself down, that is going to help with um, lowering those incidents of, uh, of implicit bias, right? Um, so another thing, um, so an example of what that could look like is to uh, set yourself that goal, right? So you have to incorporate that somewhere each day. If you're already doing it, wonderful. If you're not, say, you know, each day after I do, after I finish my lunch, I'm going to do a body scan meditation, right? And so we're kind of giving a sample how you can actually incorporate that into your life. Um, another uh, example is, you know, kind of doing some self-reflection with uh, journaling, right? So after lunch, you can ask yourself some of these questions. Where are my implicit and explicit biases? You know, how do I change? How what are my assumptions if a student approaches me for an extension? How do I ch handle challenges? What are my identities? Um, what questions can we ask ourselves, right, around bias? So just taking that time to be reflective on ourselves, right, is part of this, right? Thinking about ourselves and our own bias is another important component that we wanted to leave you with. Um, we are going to send you all these slides, and the slides have lots of links, and we wanted to tell you about some of our sources and resources. Um, so you'll see Columbia's Inclusive Teaching Guide, the Peralta Online Equity Rubric, which is like QM, but for equity, um, and the AQ um, Embracing Diversity in Online Learning. And then here, this is the Harvard's Project Implicit, which we already talked about. 
and some other great, you know, uh, teaching uh, equity focused teaching checklists and anti racist uh, pedagogy reading lists. So we'll send you uh, these resources around so that you have them. And we just wanted to thank you for joining us today and for your wonderful contributions. Okay. Do we want to put up that other slide? Yep. There thank we you go. very much. Yeah. <laughs> thank you all for joining us. And in case you need the uh, credit for attendance, you can take a screenshot of the slide. And thank you all for coming. Megan and, and Maureen, it was a wonderful session.